Hey everyone, today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh, and we'll we'll get to that, but uh, it's Tech News Day, so here's some tech news. Yeah, here's some uh, serious news that we can't possibly cover here in as much detail as it requires, but we'll try anyway. Uh, Julian Assange got arrested last week. There you go. Okay, <laughs> in, in slightly more detail, Julian Assange, looking like absolute shit, was dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he has been living for seven straight years, by British police on behalf of the American government, who is currently looking to convict Assange for conspiring to hack into a Pentagon computer back in 2010. It's a lot, and that's just that's just where you start. Yeah, it's, it is kind of odd that he was in the Ecuadorian embassy for literally as long as Game of Thrones has been on the air, but, you know, I'm not here to connect dots. It's not, it's not hmm. what I'm doing. Yes. Assange, he was the founder and face of WikiLeaks, and he has been at various points a hero or a villain to various people, depending on the circumstances. So the news of his arrest is a bit hard to process without a ton of context. When it first started 13 years ago, WikiLeaks made a name for itself as a group that whistleblowers and hackers could safely provide incriminating document leaks to, uh, which would expose all sorts of information that the governments and corporations of the world wanted to keep hidden because it made them look bad or just straight up evil. In 2010, Assange and WikiLeaks became household names when they first released some pretty really upsetting footage of a drone strike on Baghdad that killed at least a dozen unarmed civilians, including two Reuters journalists. You don't need to watch it at this point, but I remember when it came out, and I did. And it was a big deal. I already was not a fan of the war, but I was just like, okay, well, hmm. cool. Cool. Anyway, a few months after the drone strike footage uh, came a huge document dump related to the war in Afghanistan, followed by another similar set of documents about the Iraq war. Taken all together, this all made both wars look like absolute clusterfucks full of torture, friendly fire, and civilian casualties, which they were. Yeah. And possibly still are. It's a genuinely good thing that the public was told all about this, but also, on the other hand, the documents may have put a lot of people's lives at risk, particularly local informants in the war zones who were working with the U.S. military. Anyway, a lot of those leaked documents were brought to WikiLeaks by Chelsea Manning, who was working in Iraq as an Army intelligence analyst and had access to all this data and was not happy about the situation and wanted to do something about it. Uh, before the documents were even published, though, Manning was found out and arrested for those leaks and was later sentenced to 35 years in prison. That is, until President Obama commuted her sentence after she'd served six years. But, yeah, anyways, those WikiLeaks releases about Afghanistan and Iraq, along with additional big leaks from the State Department and Guantanamo Bay, put Julian Assange very much on the U.S. government's shit list. What he and WikiLeaks had done, at least on a surface level, wasn't illegal, but when the U.S. government is mad at you, they're going to do everything in their power to find anything that you could be guilty of. Uh, and complicating things for Assange was the fact that between the Iraq dump and the Afghanistan dump, he may have committed a wee bit of sexual assault on two women he met during a trip to Sweden. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so by the time police in Sweden really started investigating those allegations, though, Assange was back in London, and for the next two years, Assange was involved in legal proceedings there over whether or not he should be extradited back to Sweden to be questioned about it. Uh, he feared, correctly it turns out, that if he were to be arrested in Sweden, that would eventually lead to Sweden extraditing him to the United States. Uh, eventually, the UK Supreme Court decided that he could, in fact, be extradited, so to avoid that, Assange applied for and was granted asylum inside the London Ecuadorian Embassy. Foreign authorities could not arrest him there, but he also could never leave the building. And during the seven years Assange spent in there, uh, WikiLeaks it continued its operations. And while public opinion of WikiLeaks' earlier work had been, you know, basically been that conservative Americans hated them and more left-leaning people liked what they were doing, that dynamic got completely flipped on its head during the lead-up to the 2016 election, when WikiLeaks published a whole bunch of emails from Hillary Clinton, the Democratic National Committee, and other top Democrats. Suddenly, Democrats were very anti-WikiLeaks, and the man who would become president, Donald Trump, spoke openly about how much he loved WikiLeaks. Boy, I love reading those WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. It's been amazing what's coming out on WikiLeaks. This WikiLeaks is like a treasure trove. WikiLeaks! I love WikiLeaks. Yeah. And to be fair, while WikiLeaks' earlier leaks had exposed serious issues within the U.S. government and, you know, the wars we're fighting, the 2016 election leaks mainly served as gossip. The only notable narrative found in them was that a lot of top Democratic Party officials really didn't like Bernie Sanders. And they still don't to this day <laughs> and are very upset at yeah. the momentum that he has. Yeah. When, realistically, maybe they should just be like, 
hey, what he's doing is working. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's what? already started, folks. And I am, you know what? I'm unbuckling and I'm getting off this fucking ride. 2020. Might as well. There's no need to jump on the bus this early. Anyway, <sighs> yeah, if if you were pro Bernie in 2016, it was pretty upsetting to see such a strong internal bias against him. But it was also, it was the kind of petty shit that you'd probably find on any political party's email server. Mm. Like, they're going to always play favorites, whether you know about it or not. Uh, many speculated that WikiLeaks' shift here from exposing war crimes to just airing out political gossip was the result of Julian Assange not only picking sides in a U.S. election, but also maybe doing the work of the Russian government. And there's certainly evidence to suggest that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been the. I mean, obviously, the data could have been obtained by anyone, and WikiLeaks was just the uh, delivery service right. for this. Right. Uh, and it doesn't also, matter who is in control of it. Also, we know time. for a fact that the Republican National Committee was also hacked around that time, and Nothing somehow, somehow, those documents never, uh, either never made it to WikiLeaks, or they deliberately chose not to release them. Mm-hmm. I don't know. All a bit sus, if you yeah. ask me. But regardless of all of that, and regardless of how much Donald Trump loved WikiLeaks DNC leaks, uh, and regardless of how many votes those leaks might have shifted in his favor, the U.S. federal government currently run by Donald Trump has arrested Assange and plans to prosecute him for various crimes, in particular for allegedly helping Chelsea Manning hack into a government computer, which would mean he wasn't just publishing leaks as a journalist, uh, but was actively obtaining the info that he was leaking, which in this case goes above and beyond the role of a journalist. And Chelsea Manning, by the way, is back in jail for contempt after refusing to testify about WikiLeaks for the case against Assange. As for why Ecuador would suddenly change its mind about letting Assange live in their embassy, it's a bit unclear. A big reason is probably that the Ecuadorian president who originally granted Assange asylum, he's no longer in office. The new, the new guy, not as big of a fan of him. Uh, but we should also mention that Assange sounds like he was an absolutely terrible house guest, especially in more recent years. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's supposedly gotten in physical fights with embassy guards. He's smeared his own feces on the wall, allegedly, uh, refused to bathe, skateboarded down the hallways, played soccer indoors, and once kicked a ball at a guard who got mad about the ruckus that this was creating, and just generally made life at the embassy for the people actually working there hellish. Yeah, he uh, also wouldn't <laughs> clean up after his cat. Yeah, and I mean, you just look at him as they dragged him out. I was like, oh my God, he yeah. looks like shit. Well, I he mean, he looks like Howard Hughes pissing in bottles in his later years. Every every single thing that has ha- like that is explained in here, I believe, because he's been locked in a fucking house for seven years. Yeah, it's got to drive you crazy. I, at least in prison, you get some outdoor time. Yeah, no, I, I would not be uh, surprised if this has taken a psychological toll. Yeah. On well, him. they, they uh, uh, also, like, at towards the end, gave him basically a chore wheel that was like, clean up after <laughs> yeah. your fucking cat, yeah. bathe, like all the basic stuff that you would have to do as a child. Yeah. Um, he also allegedly uh, hacked uh, various Ecuadorian politicians' oh, devices, and they're like, when you're Julian, born, buddy, <laughs> and there's gonna we be had a, a nice thing going here. If there isn't already a comedy sitcom being made about uh, the Ecuadorian embassy and Julian Assange, there needs to be. Yeah, it's it's a great sitcom premise. Yeah, it's Stockholm Syndrome, yeah. the comedy. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyways, this was all happening while Ecuadorian taxpayers were subsidizing all of Assange's various expenses. Yeah, so, so I mean, if you're an Ecuadorian and you're like... Hey, it'd be cool uh, if these roads didn't have potholes in them. Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, you're you're uh, paying for this uh, this dude in London to live rent free. Ah, I don't know, a bit upset. In a much nicer climate, very hot yeah. in Ecuador. Is it? I don't know. It's right on the <laughs> equator. <laughs> Little known fact: Ecuador is actually Spanish for equator. Uh, anyways, Assange is a complicated guy. He's responsible for some good things. He's also responsible for things that people think are bad. He sounds kind of like an egomaniacal prick sometimes. Uh, He's worked to expose the governments of the world, but he's also clearly got a blind spot for one particularly corrupt country. Uh, And then there's, of course, the whole sexual assault thing in Sweden, which if you read the specifics uh, specifics of the allegations, it makes him seem like a real piece of shit, even if you don't necessarily see what he's accused of as a crime worth putting someone in prison over. Yeah. He hates condoms. Hmm. He hates them. Yeah. (laughs) Because they don't leak. Uh, One of them is like, the girl finally convinced him to put on a condom and then they said like, he like managed to tear it so that he could come inside her. He he had to make a leak. It's uh, it's pretty gross. He's way too obsessed with leaks. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's the main problem. This condoms not working properly. Big if true. Should be leaking. Mm -hmm. uh, how his prosecution plays out, though, could have very negative effects on press freedom. So this whole thing has forced a lot of people to basically come to terms with the fact that you can simultaneously think Julian Assange is a piece of shit while also thinking that the U.S. government's case against him is dangerous for free speech. So it's it's a wild case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean... And then the, yeah, there's the uh, the whole special counsel investigation, which is still it's not over. The investigation, well, the investigation's over, but the prosecution is going to continue, which will of course yield more. And by the time and you're the watching this episode, is tied up in that too. By the time you're watching this episode, if you're watching it on Thursday, we are going to have our first look at the nothing but black lines Robert Mueller report, just just black lines all yeah. the way through. It's going to be like. Black line, black line, black line, the black line, yeah. black line, black line. Mm -hmm. That's my prediction anyway. President blank Trump. What could it be? Uh, also, they're saying that like the only things that won't be specifically redacted will be people that have already been pushed out of key roles at the White House. So it's going to be like, yeah, Hope Hicks did this crazy shit. Yeah. What do you, I mean, she's already gone. <sighs> it's There's a lot going on. This is all speculation, by the way. We filmed this on Wednesday morning. So, yeah. Yeah, we don't know what it's going to be like. Anyways... That's fun. Um, definitely going to be following that closely because that's like a 10-year saga, mm -hmm. and it's still going. But before we get into some other news, it's time for a word from this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh. Are you stuck living in a foreign embassy, avoiding extradition to the United States on espionage charges, and unable to visit the supermarket for fresh ingredients to cook delicious meals? Or do you just stay at home because it's yeah. your choice, and the outside, it, uh, it sucks? Well, Julian, or whatever <laughs> your name is, HelloFresh yeah. is for you. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. They do all the tedious work of planning, shopping, and prepping for you so you can focus on the fun parts, cooking and eating healthy, delicious meals. These meals come together in 30 minutes or less. They call for less than two pots and pans and require minimal cleanup. So if getting into cooking seems like a daunting task, here's your easy way in. And if you already love cooking, Get out of that recipe rut and start cooking outside your comfort zone by discovering new, delicious recipes. They've got three plans to choose from, classic, veggie, and family, with the option to switch between them whenever your tastes change. They've also got uh, fun menu features to mix things up like uh, dinner to lunch, 20-minute meals, gourmet, one-pot wonders, and more. Sounds fun. And we got to try HelloFresh for the first time recently, and we loved the fact that the ingredients for each recipe come in separate bags. The recipes are easy to read and follow along with, and there's never too much of a time commitment between busting out those ingredients and sitting down for a delicious home-cooked meal. Mm -hmm. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Newsday80 and enter code Newsday80. That gets you $20 off your first four boxes. Mm. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Newsday80 and use promo code Newsday80 at checkout. It's great because I learned how to cook, and then uh, my recipes got kind of not stale, like, I kept cooking the same thing, the same mm -hmm. thing, the same thing. And it was, it's great because I've gotten really good at what I can cook. Yeah. But I needed something to spice it up. So HelloFresh with the sponsorship, I was like, cool, I'm cooking very interesting and eclectic things again. Yeah, that's my that's my favorite part about it is, uh, yeah, you're, you're cooking stuff. Yeah, I would have never, like, thought to be like, oh, I'm going to cook this. And it's like, okay. Yeah, I'll, or I'll go to, the grocery store, it. go to the grocery store and buy a bunch of ingredients that I really want to use and then won't get around to using them and then they die. Yeah, or you're like, I only need literally a teaspoon of <laughs> saffron. Yeah. Why? Are, I, I don't need a, a jug liter. of saffron. <laughs> <laughs> Too much saffron. Uh, anyways, we got plenty more tech news uh, for you today, starting with, hold on, why is there an info panel down there at the bottom with an excerpt from the Encyclopedia Britannica article on the September 11th attacks? Hmm. What the hell, YouTube? This video has nothing to do with 9-11. Well, it does now, because we're talking about it. Yeah. Uh, any, anyone, uh, actually, who turned in uh, to various mainstream news live streams here on YouTube Monday during that whole Notre Dame fire, uh, they saw this thing. Uh, it was on channels like France 24, CBS, MSNBC, Fox News. And, you know, you were probably wondering why that was there. Yeah. Or you saw that little info box and reasonably understood it to mean that the fire at Notre Dame was, in fact, an act of terrorism, just like the 9-11 attacks. Obviously, that was the what they were trying to get at with the algorithm there. <sighs> yeah, it wasn't terrorism, though. Sorry. A lot of people were uh, a little too excited to... Uh, Pull that card out. Yeah, no, very like, early on. They're like, we can't have a analytics doing this job today. We need to get Glenn Beck in here to run YouTube's uh, yeah. algorithm for the day. 
Or look, at least at this point, there's no evidence at all to, to suggest it was terrorism. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was, but Could probably, have. most likely not. Mm -hmm. All indications so far point to an accidental fire caused by renovations happening on the roof of this historic church. And if you know anything about historic buildings, all it takes is one spark. Mm -hmm. But if you were getting your news from YouTube while the fire was burning, uh, it sure as hell looked like terrorism thanks to that 9-11 info box underneath all the video streams. And uh, that was all happening just as a certain segment of right-wing social media dipshits were happily spreading their own misinformation about the fire being terrorism. Uh, YouTube's 9-11 info box was, of course, just another oopsie caused by a YouTube algorithm that's meant to combat misinformation, which YouTube quickly fixed once enough people yelled at them about it on social media. But it's yet another example of what can go wrong when you decide to let algorithms run your platform instead of actual human beings. Yeah, the... Most fucked up part about all of this is that uh, people that are claiming without any evidence that it's terrorism also are already like patting themselves up with it not being terrorism by saying, well, no matter what anyone says, if it were Muslim terrorists, we would never hear about it. Where yeah, it's just like <laughs> as if France is this pro, like France had two of the fucking worst Western terror attacks in recent memory. Yeah. Have you forgotten that? And about how like the entire <laughs> French uh, law enforcement system spent like a week, uh, you know, actively tracking these guys down. It, like, it, that's so fucked up to insinuate yeah, no, it's, that it's France just is like, like cool with terrorism. Co covering the bases, being like, being like, uh, even if I'm wrong, I'm not really wrong because you'll never hear the truth. The truth. It's yeah. literally they are literally creating conspiracy theories right now, mm -hmm. regardless of what happened or not. Yeah, it's uh, it's real fucked up, mm -hmm. and I don't know. You should uh, if if you <laughs> if you were actively excited about the possibility that this was a terror attack, maybe uh, maybe stop. Good news maybe though. Maybe cut that shit out. The 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 main structure still standing. Yeah, and they got all the art out. It's, uh, I, I, it, it did, <laughs> I, I was amused because, like, all through Monday, people were like, here's a picture of the stained glass window. You'll never be able to see it again. Here's this. You'll never be able to, and it's like, the next day, they're like, actually, yeah, everything's fine. It's just the roof. Yeah, there was, like, the, the gold <laughs> cross inside. There was a tweet yeah. going around, like, proof of God's existence. How could you say otherwise? And we're like, well, gold, uh, only melts at a heat temperature like yeah. way higher than fire, so that's why. Yeah, there's. But a, also, jet jet fuel apparently can't melt steel beams, and here we are. Mm -hmm. So maybe it is God just punishing all of us. I hope so. Except for His cross. I'll let that yeah. slide. Yeah. Yeah. It looks. That's cool. my son. This is my son. <laughs> my cross <laughs> is my son. Uh, anyways, AI, it's not all bad. Trusting AI to run a website is bad, but asking AI to invent a brand new sport, on the other hand, apparently great. Though, uh, what makes it great is the fact that anytime you ask an AI to come up with anything on its own, the results are usually stupid and ridiculous. And that's mostly the case with Speedgate, the world's first sport invented by an AI. The design agency AKQA created Speedgate to show it off at Design Week Portland, and creating it involved feeding an AI 400 sports and 7,300 rules from those sports, then testing it out in real life and refining it into something that actually made sense and was fun to play. And since at, at least one of you is going to, well, actually, us about the whole thing, the AI here was specifically a recurrent neural network along with a deep convolutional genera generative adversarial network. Uh, cool. Yeah, there you it's go. It's a lot of big words. There you go, nerds. As for what the hell Speedgate is, it's a field sport played with a rugby ball, which can uh, be either kicked or tossed underhand. Uh, mm. Each six-player team has three forwards and three defenders. The field has three gates that are circular areas with poles on two sides. Kicking the ball through the center gate grants possession, then kicking the ball through the opponent's gate, which can be manned by only one defender at a time, scores two points. But if you kick a goal and then a teammate on the other side of the gate immediately kicks it through again from the other side, that adds a point. Three pointer. There's a there's a bunch more rules, but uh, basically it's just a weird combination of rugby, handball, and soccer. This sounds confusing, but it can't be any more confusing than cricket. True. Yeah. The first AI generated sport. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only particularly dumb thing about this is the AI generated motto for Speedgate: Face the ball, be the ball, be above the ball. You're asking me to do three uh, three different things. Speed gate. Mm -hmm. They really want this to catch on as a real sport, though, and they have a team registration form on their website and plans for an intramural league in Oregon this summer. So we'll see if that works out. Probably won't. <laughs> Speedgate is honestly no different than the kind of sport a bunch of college potheads would come up with when they got bored playing Ultimate Frisbee. So maybe it will. They, that 
Is it, yeah. a, is it considered a sport, the, the game that I see at the beach where people bounce things off of a small trampoline? What? You've never seen that? I don't go to the beach. you never been on a college campus? Well, you, I, they, you have I the hacky sack. I spent four years on it. Yeah. Yeah, they had hacky sack. They, there's hacky this game where you fucking bounce prison. things on a... I haven't watched it long enough to understand what it is at all, but you set up a mini trampoline and you bounce things off of it. Well... I mean, I'll show you videos afterwards. Sounds sounds about as maybe we can find some stock this. footage of this once I figure out the name of it. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, but hey, enough about real sports. Let's talk about games. Games, video games. Sony this week unveiled a bunch of details on their next gen console, which will presumably, almost certainly, be called the PlayStation Five. Although I kind of hope they mix it up. <laughs> no, they should. Just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, PlayStation 5 works, I guess. Yeah. A Wired got the exclusive details via an interview with lead system architect Mark Cerny, who confirmed the following information. The PS5 will have an 8-core AMD CPU based off of Ryzen and a custom AMD GPU that supports ray tracing. Uh, it'll support 8K graphics, but they haven't said anything about frame rate. It'll feature 3D audio, and the hard drive will be an SSD. Wow. Yeah, well, Next that, that, gen. that's the thing. Even <laughs> Shibby brought this up on Twitter. It's like... Cool, 8K, a feature that no one's going to use for at least a couple years. They're future-proofing it. Like, I they, understand They do that, this with every console. But, like, maybe just figure out 1080p at 60 frames or 144 frames or yeah, whatever. Yeah, the fact that they haven't really, like, said yay or nay on that is I weird. guess 60 would be the only kind of realistic thing for a home entertainment system. Because yeah. you're not really buying, like, a 52-inch, 144 hertz TV. Yeah, no, I mean, but, like, also 60... I mean, you can get real elitist about it, but 60 is good enough in a lot of cases. Sure, I, I guess. think. Well, for theatrical games like Sony yeah, releases, yeah. not for twitchy shooters. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, if, if you're playing, like, Call of Duty or Fortnite or Overwatch. anything like that, uh, and you're not doing it on a computer with a mouse and keyboard, well... You're a loser! <laughs> that's on you, buddy. Yeah. Anyways, Cerny, he said that uh, in a demo, a fast travel in Spider-Man that took... 15 seconds on the PS4. It took less than a second on a PS5 dev kit, mm. thanks to that solid state stuff. So that's good. Yeah, well, also, the PS4 is years old, so I would hope that it would get the loading times up. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's a huge, that's 30 times faster. Yeah. Now, thanks to the PS5 system architecture being so similar to the PS4, it'll be fully backwards compatible with PS4 games. That's good. Yeah, that's nice. It's great that people are catching on to that. Uh, it'll also be a fairly gradual rollout, so a lot of new games will be released for both the PS4 and PS5 for a while after launch. Uh, he wouldn't discuss plans for next-gen PSVR, but he did confirm that the existing PSVR hardware would work with the PS5. So take that however you want to. I personally think that they probably will do an update because, oddly enough, the PSVR is one of the most successful uh, test cases for VR. So, yeah, but like success is such a relative term there. Sure. But it's good. I yeah, I was impressed by it. It's if they can. It's release selling that, really well as well. Yeah. So. If if two years from now uh, the costs are right for them to release one with uh, I don't know two to three times the the resolution on the head and better motion tracking. No. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Uh, there's also no word yet on when the system will actually be released, but 2019 uh, is obviously off the table. People are pretty confidently pointing at 2020. Uh, developers already have dev kits for it, so. It, Probably not too long, and uh, you could probably expect to hear a lot more around E3 time two months from now. Uh, the easy guess would be holiday season 2020. Probably like around November 5th. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's my guess. It's crazy that we're already... Hold me to it. We're already at the end of this generation, this cycle. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> It's like timed like uh, high school and college. You're like, man, can you believe it flew by so fast? Yeah. All the memories we had. And during that entire console cycle, I owned both of them and absolutely did not get my money's worth out of either of them. Uh, so. I, like, I like the PlayStation. I play it on the on the couch, but I play my Xbox all the time with uh, my father-in-law. My PlayStation is my HBO Now machine, and I haven't touched my Xbox in probably a year. I really want to play Spider-Man, but who can, yeah. who can find the time these days? Who can? Too many games. <sighs> anyway, speaking of video games, Devolver Digital, they recently released a new game that's proven to be their most controversial title ever. They've been banned from advertising the game on Facebook or Instagram, or even selling the game on the Xbox and PlayStation stores. <gasps> YouTube has made a policy of demonetizing all videos of people playing this game. Now, this is, this is the studio most known for publishing titles like Hotline Miami, Duke Nukem, and Serious Sam. So, uh, I don't know. This new game must be pretty damn violent if it's getting treated this way. Yeah. Oh. 
No, it's just a tycoon game. Yeah. Tycoon game about running a weed store. <gasps> a very legal and very cool actual thing that you can do, again, legally, in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it turns out Weedcraft Incorporated, an otherwise fairly mundane game that happens to be about cultivating and selling marijuana, it's, it's turning much. up all this, all this bad yeah. press. Uh, Devolver founder Mike Wilson told Engadget, Devolver, you know we're mostly known for games where you kill everyone in sight, even though we do a lot of other types of games, but it's just, we've not run into any of this trouble with literally any game we've ever done. And I just thought it was an interesting, shocking commentary on the games industry and also the culture, just on how backwards it is. Yeah, while writing that story, Engadget reached out to both Facebook and YouTube for comment. And while Facebook admitted that, oops, you're right, none of those original ads that we rejected actually featured anything against our TOS, YouTube, on the other hand, stood its ground and cited its policies on drugs and dangerous products or substances, which, okay, fine. But YouTube also supposedly has strict monetization policies on videos that feature uh, violence, and yet violent devolver games like Hotline Miami, Serious Sam, Shadow Warrior, Ruiner, My Friend Pedro, Ape Out, and so on. They haven't seemed to have uh, the same problems getting monetized on YouTube as Weedcraft Incorporated does. Don't they know that gaming is a art? <laughs> it is a art. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. It sounds like YouTube either needs to uh, grow the fuck up about cannabis or apply their rules more consistently. Though, we're not going to hold our breath waiting for either of those things to happen. This is like when everyone used to play drug wars on their calculators in school. Mm, yeah. 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 Well, this is the new one. I do want to try this game, but it does suck that, like, that it, nowadays, if you can't stream something, that, yeah. that kind of kills I was interested in marketing. it, but I, I just don't really like Tycoon games. So. Yeah, me neither. And from what I've read, it's, like, kind of boring. I'll just go back and play The Messenger, which they also released, and it's fantastic. I, I, this did make me look into the Devolver's library. And I'm it's, like, in, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, what a great publisher. Ape Out is fucking great. Uh, uh, Enter the Gungeon, they just released the final update for. I'm pretty sure that's that's them. Uh, yeah. Really yeah, good stuff. Uh, the My Friend Pedro game that's coming out in a couple months looks fucking great. Yeah. It's like basically a side-scroller Hotline Miami. Mm -hmm. All these games are extremely violent, though. Like, hilariously violent. Yeah. It's like, as soon as they publish a, a tycoon game about weed, it's like, what do you think you're doing, sir? Anyways, uh, speaking of Facebook, yes, you know what time it is. What other bad things do they do this week? Oh, cool, a bunch of leaked internal documents were obtained by NBC News demonstrating that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't view his users as people, but rather as, rather as troves of valuable data to be used as bargaining chips in negotiations with other companies. Mm. Cool. Awesome. Uh, now, for example, according to the article, Facebook gave Amazon extended access to user data because it was spending money on Facebook advertising and partnering with the social network on the launch of its Fire smartphone. In another case, Facebook discussed cutting off access to user data for a messaging app that had grown too popular and was viewed as a competitor, according to the documents. So, you got to kiss the ring. Mm -hmm. Zuckerberg wants you to kiss the ring, and if you do, he yeah. gives you whatever you want. Yeah. But if you compete against him... And the ring is a cock ring. Yeah. If you compete against him, though... You're cut off. Yeah. It's uh, bad. <laughs> that's, that's not fair. Yeah. And the data in question here, you know, it it's includes your, you. your friends, your relationships, your photos, what you like, and so on. Mm -hmm. All of which is valuable information about you that other companies absolutely want because it means they can serve you with relevant ads, get those clicks, and make more money. If you've ever noticed that Amazon was recommending products to you a little too well, well, that's Probably because Amazon was looking at your Facebook profile without your permission. Well, you may have given permission, but you don't know. Yeah. Uh, basically, companies that partner with Facebook, whether via advertising or a Facebook app, they, at one point, were offered access to Facebook's data trove just in exchange for money. Mm. Uh, which isn't that shocking if you've been paying attention at all, but you know, these new documents, they do give us the clearest picture yet on how this works. The money for data deal apparently never came to fruition, and Facebook, uh, they instead just chose, to, they, they used access to that data as leverage in various deals they were making. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the point is, these people don't see you as people, they see you as data, and data has financial value. You are the product. Yeah, it's just more proof of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, by the way, the source of these documents is a 2015 court case in which Facebook, uh, a Facebook app developer sued Facebook. That app developer, 643, was upset that Facebook was cutting off their access to certain types of user data, which they relied on for their app, Pekinis. <laughs> Uh, it was an app meant to help users quickly and easily find photos of their Facebook friends in bikinis. So, 
Yikes. Uh, and to be clear, Facebook didn't do this because they found the concept behind bikinis to be disgusting. They did it because after a few years of having third-party apps on their platform, they decided the apps were getting more out of the relationship than Facebook was in terms of that valuable personal data. For big brands who spend a lot on advertising, though, and companies run by friends of the Zuck, Facebook just granted them full access. Whitelisted. Mm -hmm. Have a look. We're going to make a lot of money together. Yeah. Uh, anyways, it's a long article. It's worth a read if you want a nice inside look at just how casually Facebook and its executives view your personal data while they're simultaneously out there preaching about how carefully and responsibly they're treating all of this. Also, really quick, Wired did an incredible article this week about the uh, inner workings of Facebook over the past year. Oh, good. During, during all the drama with like interviews with employees and stuff. It's a very long but good read. Yeah. I finally dropped the $5 for a Wired subscription this mm. week. I was just like... It's good journalism. They write good shit. I'm tired of incognito windowing that every time. Yeah. Tired of having, you know, three legal articles per month and then having to, like, cheat my way around it. I'm like, you know what? $5 for an annual subscription to they a great it. publication? Yeah. You can have it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Another interesting thing about this, data, this leak, and it, it's a lot of documents. Maybe it's selectively chosen, but there's they couldn't find, like, any mentions of privacy as, like, something they were concerned about. Like it was, it was all just like how to talk about privacy in public, but never how to actually yeah. protect it's it. It's just like they developing <laughs> PR uh, yeah. speech for it instead of actually doing it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, as we say every week, delete your Facebook. Also, change all your passwords because it's just smart to do. Yeah. And uh, watch our other videos. Yeah. Check out other recent videos, uh, including one about uh, sky billboards. That's another one about tech for you. Yeah. Really yeah. shitty. Just bad idea. Yeah, and if you want to support the channel like Elliot supports Wired, click the join button below the video or head over to our Patreon. Find out a tier that works for you. Thank you guys for watching. Check out the other videos. Change your passwords. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.